Welcome to the premiere of our new season. This episode, the internationally renowned Louis Armstrong House Museum and CUNY open the doors to a new state-of-the-art building, preserving and expanding the legacy of America's first black popular music icon. Soar into an aviation career with York College. Fashion, art making, CUNY sports and more. Welcome to Urban U. This will be a place where we can showcase the talents of new artists, new musicians. And they're gonna come from Queens, they're gonna come from New York City, they're gonna come from New York State, they're gonna come from around the country, they're gonna come from New Orleans for sure, and they're gonna come from all over the world. With a celebration fit for the King of Jazz, the Louis Armstrong Center opened this past summer in Corona, Queens, the neighborhood where in March 1948, Lucille Armstrong surprised the musical legend with his first real home. As Louis was traveling around the world, staying in hotels, whenever he would come back, he and Lucille would have to stay in a hotel. And Lucille indicated to Louis, this is not going to work out for the future. We have to do something about this. I want to buy a house. And Louis said no, you know, that he preferred living in hotels. So he was on a tour, and uh, Lucille, who had worked uh, prior, had an account, and she took some money from her account, her funds, and she put a down payment down uh, 80 years ago this past March. And when Louis returned, uh, she said, uh, come to your uh, new house. And he said, oh, you know, you're obviously kidding. And she said, this is the address. I'll see you there. And when she opened the door, after he knocked, he saw the house for the first time. Through the years, Pops and Lucille became well-loved fixtures in the community. Upon Lucille's passing in 1983, Louis having died in 1971, the house and its contents were given to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, who in partnership with Queens College, was given the task of turning their home into the Louis Armstrong House Museum. I just give her enormous credit you know, for wanting to see uh, the house shared you know, with not only the community, but the fans of Louis Armstrong. I think she saw it as a way of maintaining his legacy and keeping it going. And that's what it did. Uh, it was turned into an iconic destination. With the success of the museum, the idea of adding an educational center across the street seemed the next logical step. The center was always a dream of local community leaders, elected officials. There was always some talk about having some place where there could be a jazz club, where there could be exhibitions, where there could be concerts. That dream was finally realized in June 2023 with the opening of the Louis Armstrong Center. Dedicated to his and Lucille's values of artistic excellence, education, and community, it includes an archive of over 60,000 photos, recordings, manuscripts, letters, and mementos. There is also a performance space, a multimedia exhibit called Here to Stay, curated by the artistic director for jazz at the Kennedy Center, Jason Moran, as well as a digital archive. And the wonderful thing about this new Armstrong Center is that not only do we build on the heritage and legacy of Louis Armstrong, but at the same time, we create Armstrong Now. I have in my hand the ice cream trumpet, which out of the many trumpets that Louis Armstrong had during his career, this was his favorite. It's such an inspiration because it reminds us that Louis Armstrong didn't just sit behind closed doors. He sat on the stoops with the children of this neighborhood and he played his favorite trumpet. And you know they walked away saying to themselves, I'm going to make music too. We have opened a community asset, a community facility that shows that Corona is flourishing again. It will be attracting not only tourists, but school children, not only teachers, but parents, not only jazz lovers, but to be jazz lovers. I think that once people come 
and have a sense of the over 500 collages, the hundreds of reel-to-reel -reel tapes. You see some of the notes on the uh, desk, you know, to Count Basie and Barbara Streisand and Frank Sinatra and Dizzy Gillespie, the love letter to the neighborhood, the beautiful portrait of Louis Armstrong done by Tony Bennett, the voices of Louis and Lucille, the stories that are here. I think that visitors will walk away just saying two words. Oh, yeah. I'm Scott Kirby for Urban U. If you're considering a career in the air, CUNY's Aviation Institute at York College can help you reach that destination. Located only minutes from JFK Airport in Jamaica, Queens, the program offers bachelor's and master's degrees in aviation management. Our CUNY TV crew headed out to JFK to meet up with some graduates who were putting their degrees to good use. We started with Jose Cuevas, York, class of 2011. I always liked airplanes and people. And that's how Jose Cuevas came to work at JFK IAT, the company that operates JFK's Terminal 4. T4 is the largest of the airport's six passenger terminals, and JFK IAT was the first private terminal operator in the United States. And Jose has some firsts on his personal resume as well. He's a first-generation immigrant from the Dominican Republic who came to the United States with his mom. And when I decided to migrate to the United States at the age of 17, no knowing one word in English, I researched what kind of institutions in the States uh, offered some sort of aviation-related program. After a brief stop at CUNY's LaGuardia Community College to improve his English language skills, Jose moved on to the aviation program at York College as his final destination. These days, you can find him roaming the T-4 concourse, making sure the complex federal regulations involved with air travel are seamlessly integrated with a best-in-class travel experience. Commercial operations in an airport is basically taking a mall from the street and bringing it to, to an airport. Although we are regulated more than others, uh, we deliver a better experience uh, to, in comparison to many industry. Jose also hopes to encourage the next generation of immigrants that they can do it too. I see myself just inspiring the next generations of Latinos that come to this country uh, that um, have even struggles learning the language and think that uh, they cannot make it happen. Aviation welcomes everyone. Aviation is not just flying an airplane. I refer to aviation, specifically airports, being kind of a city within the city. So I see myself inspiring the next generation uh, of students to, to come and join us. The next stop on our JFK tour led to JetBlue's hangar, where we found Diana Rodriguez, York class of 2017, and now a JetBlue aircraft mechanic. I participated a lot in the clubs. Uh, you were able to attend the conferences and meetings such as the Women in Aviation Conference. And it was experiences like that conference and an aviation-related study abroad program in Greece that helped propel Diana to blaze a trail and pursue her interest in becoming an aircraft mechanic. While Diana says gender diversity is improving in the field, in 2021, the FAA reported that only 2.62% of certificated aircraft mechanics identified as female. When I was younger, I definitely didn't see myself in the office. I can't sit down from nine to five. <laughs> I remember when I first started here, I noticed that I was the only girl on shift. But honestly, with aviation, it's definitely changing and aviation is progressing. I've noticed a lot more, especially when I go to work, I look around and there's a lot more female mechanics, pilots, also gate agents, ramps too. And before we parted, Diana did what she does every single day, popped open a hatch on an Airbus A320 to give us a whole different perspective on aviation, a perspective she wants to pass on to the next generation. Aviation is so vast. Even if you don't like one thing, you just keep trying. There's so many doors in aviation, um, so many opportunities that you could do. If it doesn't work out, do something else. Our final stop brought us to the Port Authority, where we found Stephen Gao, York class of 2017, whose job as a wildlife operations supervisor is critical to airport safety. 
Uh, we have a variety of wildlife at the airport. Uh, we have muskrats, we have herring gulls, we have laughing gulls, we have terns, diamondback terrapins, we have rabbits, we have red-tailed hawks, snowy owls, we have bald eagles by rare occurrences. They do show up at the airport, they do pass through the airport. During the time we spent with Stephen, he demonstrated a number of animal control techniques that are used at the airport to keep both animals and travelers safe, but he credits his time at York College for helping his aviation career take off. I felt like I love to travel, I love food, so I was like, why not give aviation a shot? You know, and that's something that I could see myself doing 20, 30 years from now. So hopefully we've showed you some of the career paths that are possible with a degree in aviation. And if one of those paths is for you, perhaps your college can help you get there. I'm Andrew Falzone for Urban U. Still up on Urban U, a focus on arts at CUNY, with a look at what it's like to learn ceramic making at Queen's College and the remaking of a century-old dress with a CUNY fashion lab. But first, did you know that the first headquarters of the United Nations were right here at CUNY's Lehman College? Stay tuned! As the story goes, when the first UN headquarters in New York was built, UN staff would open their newly crafted ballot box, and they found a note already in there left by a worker. It read, let me cast the first ballot for world peace. However, this wasn't at the UN building we know today on Manhattan's east side. This was at the first headquarters of the United Nations in America, some nine and a half miles north at Hunter College in the Bronx, what is today Lehman College. For five months in 1946, from March 25th until August 15th, in many ways, the Bronx was the center of the world. Today, there are 193 member states in the United Nations, but in 1946, just 51 nations were meeting to sort out some semblance of international order in the wake of World War II. And while the fledgling organization had met before, the first General Assembly met in London in January 1946, it would be Hunter College's Bronx campus, which would be its first regular home here in America. The delegates arrive at the Hunter College campus for this historic event, inaugurating UNO's permanent residence in the United States. During the war, the Navy had taken over Hunter's Bronx campus as a training ground for its women's Naval Reserve program. So with the war ending and the Navy moving out, Mayor William O. Dwyer and Bronx Borough President James J. Lyons successfully pitched a beautiful campus, now with a tenant moving out, as a perfect landing spot. Now, the plan was always for a first home to be temporary taking over a set of buildings, ultimately being far less desirable than building new ones. And indeed, Hunter College's president, George N. Schuster, was not a fan of his buildings being the ones taken over, even temporarily, for a second time in a row. But out went the Navy and in went the UN. In just 15 feverish days, workers transformed the campus. What was once a gymnasium? now could accommodate instead 692 delegates, staff, and press. Flags of the 51 nations line the grounds outside. In presiding over this meeting, the first of the council to be held on the hospitable shores of these United States. And while its tenure at Hunter was short-lived, some noteworthy United Nations history did take place here in its brief time. Most notably, in response to debate to remove Soviet troops from Iran, 
the USSR's representatives under Andrei Gromyko staged a walkout of the Security Council, the first of what would be dozens over the years as the burgeoning Cold War began. Famed businessman and presidential advisor Bernard Baruch would present his Baruch plan to the UN's Atomic Energy Commission, which proposed, and of course ultimately failed, to limit nuclear technology internationally to only peaceful purposes. And perhaps best remembered, as the first chairperson of the UN Commission on Human Rights, Eleanor Roosevelt began work on what would become 1948's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. After the UN left in August, Hunter could start to work on reclaiming its school. And it wouldn't be until 1951 that the United Nations officially moved to the iconic building along the East River in the bustle of Midtown Manhattan we know today. Until then, UN meetings would bounce around various locations in New York and also briefly Paris. But for five months in 1946, as borough president James J. Lyons boasted, history will record that the Bronx was the first capital of the world. For Urban U, I'm Ari Goldberg. Resurrecting a dress with a powerful history was an idea that captivated CUNY professor Eugenia Policelli. We are very happy to uh, introduce you uh, the, uh, this dress, the Tanagra uh, dress. The beautiful Tanagra dress was designed by Rosa Giannoni in 1908. But as time went on, the dresses disappeared. There were only photographs and written descriptions, even though it was a very significant garment. There was a photograph of herself in a book that she prepared in 1909, uh, stating also this agency of the designer, of a woman designer. Uh, but she wore it in order to give a speech at the first national conference of women in Italy. She stood up and gave a speech about fashion and feminism, which was absolutely revolutionary. It was based uh, on these statuettes, uh, Greek statuettes that they were found in the city of Tanagra. The dress was uh, uh, dynamic and transformable. You could uh, pin it in one way or in another. She did a version that was black, another version that was uh, off-white. Different uh, uh, versions of the same design, which was a very modern concept. Eugenia studied photos and writings about it. She put the challenge to one of her master's students, pattern maker Cristina Trupiano. The beauty of it is that it can be manipulated and wrapped many different ways. It's made of silk charmeuse and silk georgette and is white to salute the women's suffrage movement. The Tanagra dress is a small portion of Professor Policelli's world-renowned focus on the fabric of cultures. The idea came uh, to understand uh, the mechanisms of, uh, you know, the fashion industry as a multi-billion uh, industry, but also as a symbolic force uh, to understand uh, the connections between uh, 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 textile, uh, fabric, fashion, and dress uh, in relation to personal identities, collective identities, national identities. She's done lectures around the world and exhibitions. Her students say she's dynamic and uses her connections in the industry to help their careers. She's a ball of energy. She is go, 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 and has lots of stories about everything. Melinda Byam got her bachelor's degree at Pratt and designed children's clothing for 15 years before coming to study with Eugenia. Her research includes interviewing children about their clothes. This is what I like about this garment. This is why yeah. I don't like, I don't like these leggings. I don't like the feel, I don't but like the look. Did the mother like and she bought it for her? The or? mother, yeah. Who's, oh, yeah, and it's she also refused. interesting if who's buying. Uh -huh. I was seeing as a parent and as a designer of children's fashion that there was a disconnect and that we weren't talking to children about what they actually want to wear. There's also a sustainability element. If, if you're making things that the parent is buying and then it goes into the closet, that's not very sustainable. 
Eugenia grew up in Canossa in Puglia, Italy. Her family didn't work in fashion, but good clothing was valued, especially if it came with important memories. She once asked her mom's sister, a seamstress, for a favor. I had the chance uh, uh, when I was uh, 21 uh, to go to her and say, I would love to do something with these two pillowcases. <laughs> My mother said, oh, this belongs to your grandmother. And then she created uh, uh, this A-line skirt uh, that I very proudly wore. A Eugenia's higher education in Italy focused on English literature and feminist theory. She came to the U.S. in 1987 to get her Ph.D. Then at CUNY, the crossover of fashion, feminism, identity, and sustainability called to her. Exhibitions for the Fabric of Cultures had student projects, like unraveling denim to create something new. And of course, many pieces were the work of highly artistic designers, like Antonio Maras, who combined classic men's fabrics with lace and sequins to explore identity. Eugenia also teaches Italian studies, and she writes on cinema. In fact, she helped create the short film Dress in Motion, the Tanagra dress reframed, which can be seen online and which shows she is thrilled to have guided the resurrection of a piece of history. This is the only version uh, that exists of this dress, so we are very <laughs> proud of this. We have the object right here, it's not a photograph. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. And they all dictate and control what kind of color you got. Sin Ying Ho teaches glazing technology at Queens College. She is showing the students how to use one of the five kilns in the Queens College ceramics department. Okay, so this is where the burners, what we are talking about. So when we fire, after we are loading the kiln, we open this firebox. Sin Ying teaches not only about so using the kiln, but the art of ceramics. When we are working particularly in ceramics, we're going through so long of the history, and then within the history, culture is already colliding. CUNY has a number of ceramics programs, including the ones at Queensboro and Kingsborough Community Colleges and at Hunter College. And here at Queens College, Jessica Stolfa is the studio technician. Being a student here and having the ability to have this hands-on experience is not something that every ceramic student gets in other studios. I kind of learned along the way. And as with Queens College and most of CUNY, students come from all around the world. Over the years, they've produced a wide variety of pieces. We have students uh, from a very variety of backgrounds. We have people coming from Asia, in our community, they're from Turkish and Jewish. The ceramics that was really drawn to uh, Asian students because that they, they have that kind of history very um, embedded to their culture. I'm having a this for the stoneware, and so that I could apply it over the stoneware and then have it uh, fired for the projects. Jessica Stolfa is also a working ceramist and sells her work to restaurants, coffee shops, and other places. Some of the work she showed us was fired right here at the college. This was made here, right on this campus, maybe from start to finish, between forming the, the pot on the wheel letting it dry, trimming, and then firing it twice. I would say this took about anywhere from two to three weeks from start to finish. In the past, students have showcased their work at galleries and elsewhere, and Sing Ying herself has shown her work all around the world. All the blue area is all hand-painted, and uh, so I, I'm kind of learning from my heritage, from my ancestor, how to do the particular style of painting. And perhaps some of the students, just like Jessica, will continue with ceramics beyond the classrooms at Queens College. I took that class when I was a student, and it proved really helpful because I not only work here, I work at two other studios, and they need someone like me that can understand the material and be able to mix 
these raw materials to make glazes for them. And so we're trying to prepare students if they do decide to take this further than just undergrad and, and want to kind of branch out and go to different studios. This is the kind of knowledge that they need to have. For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson. Caught. It's only practice, but the City College lacrosse players are psyched. And the men and women's practice on this field in Harlem shows it. Their coach has big plans. We would like for this program to get back to the point where it runs a little bit more like a varsity program. What you see is club play, not an official NCAA team. The game was first played at the college here in Hamilton Heights in 1887 and was a Division I team. It lost the designation and the coach thinks the time is right to get it back. It really just comes down to can we raise the money to fund a Division III program. Money would have to come from alumni and the college, which generally doesn't fund athletics. But players and student athletes feel excited about the possibility. It's going to be awesome, not for this, just for the school, but for the players who are working hard every day, getting better. Like from what we were four years ago to now, is there any big difference? I meet all the alumni, uh, they also come to our games. Like they love lacrosse and they want to bring it back. For the school, I think it's just getting back to what we used to be. This lacrosse used to be our thing. And it's time to just get back to that. Alumni do come to games and the coach hopes he can count on them. I think what we have and, and what we're continually trying to build is a, is a community. You're part of something that's 136 years old. You know, you're, you're part of this legacy that, that stretches way back. Wilson plans to continue to push the team on the field and everyone else. Really, my goal at the end of the day is just creating a program um, where a student's four years here at City are better because they played lacrosse as opposed to not playing lacrosse. The idea to bring lacrosse back to prominence at City is still new, and the coach thinks he can pull it all together and present it to the NCAA in two years. I'm J.D. Johnstone, City College News. And that's a wrap. For more episode highlights and sneak peeks into our upcoming stories, meet us on our social media platforms. Thank you for watching these stories from the largest university in the nation, the City University of New York.